The following video is brought to you by Worthless, the young person's indispensable guide to choosing the right major by Aaron Clary. The Postmodern Adventures of Kill Team One book series by Mike Leone. The Adventures of Morgala by John David. All of our wonderful fans on Patreon and viewers like you. Thank you. The following is a world class bullshit as exclusive. There's no doubt that Solo is struggling at the box office. Struggling is too kind of a word. It's it's bombing badly. There's no way to spin that. But they're trying to place the blame somewhere else. Poor marketing. I can see that. Maybe. But I noticed the same amount of ads that I noticed for The Last Jedi. In regards to The Last Jedi, I noticed how late the trailer dropped and how I wasn't bombarded with the impending doom that was Ryan Johnson's epic fail in the making like I was The Force Awakens. So when I see the same amount of ads for Solo, I figure it was marketed the same way. According to Deadline, that's not the case. Solo, a no-go due to poor marketing, not franchise fatigue, Analyst says. You ever notice you can't spell analyst without anal? Doug Krutz, a veteran media analyst at Cowan, issued a report to investors that reaffirmed his market perform rating on Disney shares. While his report is based on financial views of the company, it allows the analyst a chance to wade directly into the pop culture waters to offer his take on why Solo stumbled. Point by point, the report knocks down some of the suggested culprits, from the production woes to tight release calendar spacing just five months after The Last Jedi, to lingering fan animus towards The Last Jedi. If the franchise was able to survive the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, we have a hard time believing The Last Jedi could have done that much damage, Kroots writes. Projecting a final domestic tally of about $200 million, Kroots noted that Solo's international gross is accounting for just 75% of the global cum, the lowest percentage of any franchise entry or spin-off to date. Given the hefty production and marketing costs, he concludes the film may well finish in the red. Even so, he writes that the film's struggle has occasioned some concern that audiences may be suffering from Star Wars fatigue. We think this is probably not the case and that Solo's biggest problem is an uncharacteristically, for Disney, poor marketing campaign. Summoning a notable degree of fan acumen, he argues that the marketing for Solo failed to persuasively sell Alden Ehrenreich as a young Han Solo, a character originated on screen more than 40 years ago by Harrison Ford. By contrast, Cruz pointed to the cheeser for Rogue One, which came out 247 days before the movie. But who's counting? Cruz, apparently. The first 35 seconds of the trailer almost exclusively focused on Felicity Jones as the protagonist, Jyn Erso, selling her as a new franchise hero, he writes. The second half is dominated by the Imperial Alert klaxon and Forrest Whitaker's voiceover, and practically screams epic at the viewer, before closing in on another shot of Jones. The first teaser for Solo, he noted, came out just 100 days from the release. The teaser, by our count, only had about 10 seconds of screen time, where Anrak's face was clearly in the picture. Not, in our opinion, nearly enough. Kroots also amuses about the production issues that have dodged three of the four Star Wars entries since Disney bought Lucasfilm. We're not sure why this has been the case, particularly compared to Marvel, which has been an incredibly well-oiled machine, he writes. One suggestion, he adds, promote Dave Filoni to a higher level of importance at Lucasfilm. Filoni has spearheaded Star Wars animated Rebels and Clone Wars, and is an executive producer on the upcoming Resistance. Ending on an optimistic note, Kroots predicts that the climate for Episode Nine in 2019 will do quite well at the box office, probably exceeding The Last Jedi. Untold millions of fans and Disney investors hope that they can take this forecast to the bank. And we have to make sure that doesn't happen. The optimistic appraisal of the situation is, if anything, quaint. Doug Kroots is not a shill and has no financial stake in Disney Star Wars continuing success. Well, I hope not, at least. So his take on the situation seems to come from a place we can all agree sounds reasonable. But I do have a problem with this quote. If the franchise was able to survive the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, we have a hard time believing The Last Jedi could have done so much damage. That's Doug's first problem. I don't think Doug follows the Star Wars situation the same way we do. He doesn't know all the factors. He's not part of the solution. The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones weren't praised in the media the way the new films are so blindly loved by those with something to gain or lose. There wasn't the sense that something was off with the media coverage. People just accepted the films for what they were, and this thing called a three-year gap that allowed the fans to rest up and take a breather existed. Now it's only been five months. It is 100% possible that the five-month gap is an issue, but not the only issue. The lack of rest on top of the mistreatment of the fans by Lucasfilm is what hurts Solo. People disliking a film is getting them raked over the coals by those who think of themselves as enlightened. George Lucas never talked to the fans the way Kathleen Kennedy's regime is currently doing. That's bad business. CBS had an article from 2012 titled, Five unspoken rules that can get you fired. In it, they list things that can get you fired from a company. Number three was particularly interesting. Disparage the company's products or customers. Especially if you're an executive, remember that any time you're in public, at a conference, in an airport, even on your own time, you represent the company, and that anyone with a cell phone can record you. The same goes for talking to the media, or anyone who just might repeat what you have to say. 
People talk, just like you do. Now who does this sound like? Come on, think about it. Him? No. Him? No. Him? Who is that? If not any of them, then who? Oh. I know. Yeah. Him. Yes, the man who killed Luke Skywalker and ruined the franchise. Well, that's all behind us, you'd say. Ryan Johnson has been radio silent for a while. He's no longer attacking the fans. He's back. In his latest Twitter bitch fit, Johnson was back on the attack against a fan who critiqued The Last Jedi. He went into full beta mode. On social media, a few unhealthy people can cast a big shadow on the wall, but over the past four years I've met lots of real fellow Star Wars fans. We like and dislike stuff, but we do with humor, love, and respect. We're the vast majority, and we're having fun and doing just fine. Someone responded with, Critique and showing dislike against something is trolling? Good tactic, whatever makes you sleep at night. Then Ryan Johnson has the gall to say this, Done with this disingenuous bullshit. You know the difference between not liking a movie and hatefully harassing a woman so bad she has to get off social media, and you know which of those two we're talking about here. The person responds with, I don't necessarily deny that this person was harassed, but I deny your claims of my concerns being dangerous because of your extremely predictable assumption of my implications. Ryan Johnson fires back one more time with, Your implication was not an implication at all. It was explicitly stated in your tweet. You're conflating critiquing a movie with being an abusive asshole to people online. When it's clear as day they are two separate things, and we're condemning the latter and not the former. Johnson is so up his own keister that he doesn't know which way is up. And yeah, I said keister. I watched Home Alone recently. Get over it. Ryan Johnson refuses to take into account that he's possibly the problem. He's like an addict. He refuses to believe that he has a problem, even though everyone around him sees the needle in his arm. This Twitter outburst is nothing new. We've heard it a lot. The man just can't believe he made a bad Star Wars movie. Now, I wouldn't make a video just about Ryan Johnson's Twitter meltdown, because that's all I'd ever do. I brought this to your attention because it was referenced in the most sanctimonious piece of trash I've ever had the displeasure of reading in my life. Over on the irrelevant website io9, an article titled, People in Positions of Power Need to Help Shut Down Vitriolic Fan Behavior appeared. First off, what a dumb concept. I mean, who the hell thinks this is a good idea? Oh, this kind of person. If you've spent literally any time on the internet interacting with fans of pretty much any genre franchise like Ghostbusters, Star Trek, or Star Wars, then you know that what begins as an impassioned debate can quickly descend into hostile, vitriolic trolling, or a bunch of smug idiots with stupid politics try to infuse their garbage into our beloved franchises, and the fans get mad. At some point over the past few weeks, actress Kelly Marie Tran, who played Rose Tico in Star Wars The Last Jedi, deleted all of her Instagram posts for reasons that have not yet been explained. io9 has reached out to Tran's representatives for comments about what happened, but as of publishing, they've not returned our calls. Multiple reports are alleging that it might have been response to a racist or misogynist troll post from the Star Wars fandom. Reports themselves based off an as-yet unverified tweet from a fan account that spread quickly on social media. Allegations. Allegations! Shove your allegations directly up your ass. First off, look at the source. An as-yet unverified tweet from a fan account. It doesn't get much more credible than that. Back to the article. Regardless of the specific reasons for trans disappearance from Instagram, fact remains that groups of fans targeting specific people for harassment is a very real problem and it's not likely going away soon unless people get serious about addressing it head on. This afternoon, The Last Jedi director Ryan Johnson took to his own Twitter account to speak about his personal and overwhelmingly positive experience with the community. And I already read you those tweets. Johnson has dealt with more than his fair share of loud, angry harassment from fans, and so his faith in the rest of the Star Wars massive community is heartening. But as a person who's in a unique position with power in regard to Star Wars, Johnson, like other franchise directors and studio executives, can and should feel more than comfortable telling fans not to be shitty to one another. The contingent of fans that claim that the inclusion of more women, people of color, and queer people are ruining Hollywood is probably very small in reality. But that doesn't change the fact that these people feel emboldened to go after those they don't like and attempt to make their lives a living hell. There are countless numbers of good fans who spend plenty of time explaining why diversity is ultimately making the genre franchises stronger and more narratively interesting. But, even together, their voices don't have nearly the same reach as the kind of people like Johnson's do. That's why it's important now more than ever for prominent creators to just straight up call out people for their blatant bigotry. There is the idea that explicitly addressing a fandom's bad behavior could have unintended effects of backfiring and ultimately end up hurting a movie's bottom line. But by ignoring it completely, studios or other entities send a message to the rest of the fandom that the abuse fans are suffering at the hand of their peers is not a concern. Yes, there are plenty of more Star Wars fans out there that identify with the Resistance, which you know is the kind of overall message of the franchise as opposed to the First Order. 
and they will continue to love and care about Star Wars for years to come. But there will always be fans who would rather act in bad faith and accept that Star Wars isn't only for them. It would be in Lucasfilm and Disney's best interest to make it crystal clear that they don't support or condone reprehensible behavior. Fans, do better. Writer, stop sucking. First off, Ryan Johnson is the last person that needs more power. He's already spent the last six months abusing it. More is just a bad thing. The writer's entire article collapses in on itself with this one sentence here. There's the idea that explicitly addressing a fandom's bad behavior could have unintended effects of backfiring and ultimately ending up hurting the movie's bottom line. That's what's happening with Solo. Audiences don't care if Ron Howard directed it. All they know is that the guy who directed the bad Star Wars is an asshole, and they're not going. These people in power aren't the right people for the job. They have agendas and higher-ups to answer to, so they can keep their positions of power. They're the puppets of someone else. They don't speak for themselves, and they shouldn't speak for the fans. Ryan Johnson has gone on record saying he intentionally creates films that he wants 50% of the audience to hate. He's already antagonizing the fans from the get-go. With an attitude like that, how is he qualified to speak on behalf of fandom? He's not. No one attached to these movies are. They're walking advertisements. They exist to create a product that Disney or another company can sell, and they sign their lives away in the process. They sell their dignity away, too. Ryan's not being an asshole just to be an asshole. This time. No, Ryan Johnson is lashing out because Kelly Marie Tran, a.k.a. Rose Tic Tac Tico, left Instagram, as stated in the article above. This was further reported on News.com out of Australia. The article shows the outrage of the fans, but then it does one notable thing. It lies. The article ends with, The news comes after Tran's Last Jedi co-star Daisy Ridley, who plays Rey, last year revealed she had quit Instagram. Ridley said social media was highly unhealthy for people's mental health. I don't do social media anymore. I came off it last September and I will never go back, she told Radio Times. It's such a weird thing for young people to look at distorted images of things they should be. Now, nearly two years ago, The Independent put out an article covering the situation. It says, Daisy Ridley surprised her devoted legion of over 2 million followers when she decided to delete her personal Instagram in August of this year. Jumping to conclusions about what prompted the hiatus, many assumed it had been triggered by online bullying. However, it turns out they were wrong. The 24-year-old Star Wars actress has now explained she decided to take a break from social media because she could no longer bear the pressure of growing up in front of millions. The London-born actress said she felt the need to deal with stuff personally and privately rather than in the public domain of Instagram. Oh, so it wasn't the Star Wars fans that drove Daisy Ridley off social media. It's pretty disingenuous to, uh, you know... Throw this on the end of an article intended to paint the fans in a negative way and perpetuate lies! You wonder why there's a division between the fans and self-appointed gatekeepers of social justice. Their bullshit tactics don't work on those with a brain and five minutes to do research. These people, and I'm using the term loosely here, are the reason for this bad movement in entertainment. They lie to prove their cause is big and that they think everyone else is wrong. Fuck those people. They're killing Star Wars and costing Disney something to the tune of $55 million in the process on Solo alone. I thought Disney was in the business of making money. I guess ideology trumps that. Their failure is a win for the fans and people are rejoicing. Yet these neck dirt having mofos, and yeah I said mofos, I was watching Austin Powers, fight me, are doubling down. No one's friend, John Campia, was spurging out on another live stream attempting to attack the fans. Again. I guess his attempt at playing both sides by calling for Kathleen Kennedy's resignation didn't sit well with anyone. It's embarrassing to have to talk about John Campia. The man is not well. He's mentally unstable. He's what you would call... Fragile. It must be Italian. Well, I think that says fragile, honey. Oh, yeah. Whatever you want to say about him, he's desperately seeking to find his place in the changing world of reliable news, and for him, everything's coming up Millhouse. So this is the latest battle in the war between the fans and those in power over at Disney. And it seems like the tide is turning, because what seemed like a nice victory for the failure of Solo is now turned into a bunch of shaming on behalf of Ryan Johnson. And as I said earlier, who the hell is that guy to judge? That guy is a weird nihilist asshole with a perfectly round head, which has no bearing on his personality, but his personality is piss poor, and that's all that matters. You know, channels like this, Geeks and Gamers, and Ethan Van Skyver's Comic Artist Pro Secrets are definitely gaining a following because thousands, and I mean thousands, we're like combined with like 160-something thousand people are pissed off with this. That's not a small number. If you multiply that by the number of tickets each person would buy, that's a huge chunk to the box office. They need to stop acting like people aren't angry with the Star Wars situation. Because if everything was all sunshine and rainbows, we'd all be lining up to see Solo a Star Wars story. In the age of the internet, everyone has access to know when a film comes out. Was the film marketed poorly? Probably. The trailers weren't very good. 
I don't know if I would say that makes it marketed poorly, but whoever had creative control in the trailer department did a bad job. And you have to wonder, was this intentional? Is this part of Lucasfilm's plan? Kathleen Kennedy is very ideologically driven, not money driven. She only wants to talk about diversity and inclusion in the story group, and these people that make these stories aren't very good. There's a very big possibility that they could use Han Solo as the sacrificial lamb to say, hey, the old characters don't sell, people want the new stuff, and female-led action franchises are the future. But they're not. You know, Ocean's 8 is very lucky, because it's coming out, there's not a lot of competition, Avengers has blown its load, Deadpool has blown his load twice, and Star Wars... Han Solo just failed. He couldn't even get it up. There was no chance. So, I guarantee you right now, the media is going to use Ocean 8's opening to further the point that, well, maybe it's time for more female-led films and blah 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 and gender swapping's good and gender swapping's this. I point you in the direction of Ghostbusters two years ago. They tried this. They tried to attack the fans. Paul Feig fucking failed. Amy Pascal fucking failed. The movie fucking failed. It's not good. It's a terrible film. I had to watch it for Patreon. It's shit. People weren't mad that they made Ghostbusters with women as much as they were mad that, one, they're remaking Ghostbusters. I mean, let's not forget the fact that people are fed up with remakes in general. How many fucking times do we need to see the same story? We don't. Ghostbusters is one of those hallmarks in cinema that was just perfect the way it was. It still is relevant. People still know who you're going to call when you ask the question. Melissa McCarthy, Leslie Jones, and the other two, nobody gives a shit about them. No one gave a shit about them. You know, I always talk about merchandise on this channel and how it's an indicator of the health of a brand. Well, Ghostbusters merchandise was on clearance before the movie came out. Stores wanted to get rid of that shit. My dying Toys R Us had all the Ghostbusters available, the female ones, that is, because over on the other shelf, there were the male Ghostbusters, and they were picked through. You had a couple Rick Moranises, and you had a few Sigourney Weavers left. But that failed. That failed hard. Ghostbusters Answer the Call, which it's now being referred to as, is a $5 bargain hit at your local Walmart. And let me rephrase that. It's not even a hit. It's a $5 bargain embarrassment. People don't want it for $5. People don't want it. It's the type of movie when you're flipping through your DVR, oh, Ghostbusters is on at 8. And then you see it says 2016, and you watch anything else, because fuck that movie. And that's where we are with Star Wars. Fuck these movies. They're made poorly. Maybe there's some artistry in there. Maybe there's not. Did The Last Jedi look nice? At times. Was Canto Bite overblown? Very much so. Was it relevant? No. Was Rose Tico lame? Intentionally lame. Was Finn stupid? Intentionally stupid. The thing is, all these characters were made to look a certain way, and the old characters were made to be, like, brushed aside, and, hey, you suck, and you're old, and nobody wants you anymore. There's even that stupid line, let the past die killed if you have to. Well, guess what? We're fed up with that, and we're killing the future, the present. There's nowhere to go with this but down. So... I'm getting on a rant that I don't want to get into right now. So I want to thank everyone that watches our videos. And thanks to almost 52,000 of our subscribers. I appreciate it more than you can ever imagine. And I thank you. If you're a fan of this channel, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you have the thumbs up hit for this video. And make sure you got the bell notified so you can get these videos as soon as they come out. If you're a super fan and you want to get in on more World Class Bullshitters content, make sure you join our Patreon page. A buck a month goes a long way. Five bucks, which is only 17 cents a day, goes even further. We give you access to all kinds of extra digital content, a bonus to the podcast, everything. It's great value and entertainment, and it helps this channel grow. Next year, we're going to be at Star Wars Celebration, and that's going to be a good time, hopefully. But it's a chance to meet all of you people, and we hope that as many of you as possible come out. I'll be back tonight with World Class Bullshitters, the epitome of pop culture, where we have a full show to discuss every facet of entertainment. And uh, you don't want to miss out. So thanks again, and I'll catch you next time.